Hello, my name is Rob Filippa from New Amsterdam Advisory Services and welcome to this video in which I'll take you through a representative sample of test questions for the FINRA Series 3 exam, the National Commodities Futures exam, or also known as the, the Futures and Option exam. We'll look at a variety of topics and we'll take some sample questions and we'll analyze the questions as well as the answers and help you better understand the concepts behind them and prepare you for successfully taking the test. So let's jump right into it. So first we'll look at the futures basics. We'll touch on some of the common terminology in the futures market and we'll take a look at how futures markets are operating. Okay, let's look at another uh, test question for your series three test, um, this time around the futures basics. Let's say the question could be, which of the following does not accurately describe the futures market pricing structure? And we're giving, given a couple of options. Uh, futures pricing is above the price of the commodity itself. Futures prices go down the further out the delivery date is. Pricing for commodities and futures tend to move in the same directions and futures pricing is upward sloping. So as always, um, look for the keywords in the question. And in this case, remember, we're talking about what does not accurately describe the structure. Um, pricing of futures has two types uh, and structures, the normal and the inverted uh, pricing structure. We'll go into this in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, for now, remember, if no reference is made to one or the other specifically, always assume that the normal pricing structure is what is relevant. Um, it has to do with the use of what's called the near and far months of futures contract. So the near months are ones with a earlier delivery. The far months have delivery in uh, months further into the future. So those are two concepts to keep in mind. With all that said, we need to determine two things, what are normal and what are inverted markets. And then we have to find out what the impact is on the futures pricing structure from each of those. So let's move a little bit deeper into the question. Um, the normal pricing structure that we are referencing here means that the farther contracts uh, typically trade at a higher price than the contracts with a closer delivery date. Um, that has to do with the uh, associated cost of commodities over time where people pay for storage, for insurance, for financing, and, and so on and so forth. That, as opposed to the inverted pricing structure where near contracts actually trade at a higher price than the uh, further out months. And this generally has to do with a shortage in commodities whereby the, the current price of the commodity is higher, reflecting the, the shortage. Um, thirdly, uh, that regardless of the market, the, the different months, near or far, tend to move in the same direction. That is a, a, a very common aspect of the pricing structure. With all that said, uh, we can see that answer B in this question, futures prices go down the further out the delivery date is, um, is actually incorrect. It goes up uh, instead of going down the further out it is. But remember, we're looking for an incorrect statement as the answer to this question. So B is the right answer. A couple of things to remember. Um, as always, remember to look for the keyword. We're looking for not here. 
as opposed to what is correct. Um, we touched on two types of pricing structures, the normal and the inverted markets. Um, and unless it's specifically indicated differently, always assume a normal pricing structure is what is relevant. Um, the, uh, the storage, the insurance, financing costs make FAR contracts more expensive than near contracts under this particular structure. And although the degree of price change can differ by month, the direction is generally the same. So there you have it. I hope this helps in your test prep and I'll uh, see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Hello, here's another uh, test question for your series uh, three test prep um, around the topic of futures basics. Um, question could be which of the following is false regarding the open interest in a futures contract? And we could have a couple of different answers here, like, for instance, higher liquidity means smaller spreads for the contract. Changes in open interest confirm whatever trend is being observed in the market. A decrease in open interest indicates market participants are exiting. And a higher open interest in a contract means higher liquidity. A couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, as always, look for the key word. Um, we're looking for which of these statements is false. Um, important to keep in mind. As far as open interest in a contract, open interest is simply the number of contracts that have not been closed out yet or offset. So the, these are contracts bought or sold in the market where the buyer or the seller has not yet taken the opposite position and closed out or offset the initial trade. A couple of things we need to determine. Um, first off, what's the impact of open interest on liquidity? And then subsequently, how does liquidity impact prices or more specifically price spreads? And as well, um, whether or not open interest gives an indication about a trend. So let's dig into this uh, a little bit more detail. Liquidity and spreads. Um, what we can generally say, not just in futures, but any market, um, when there are more buyers or more sellers and therefore higher liquidity, spreads will always narrow. So more buyers, more sellers means a narrower or tighter spread. The reverse is true as well across all market not just the futures market. Less, the, less liquidity equals less buyers and sellers, and therefore a widening spread. A high open interest can either have a positive or a negative, negative effect on prices. Um, it doesn't by definition say um, which way that goes, because it depends on whether or not the open interest is driven by more sellers or more buyers being eager to get into the market. So with that said, we can say that answers A, C, and D to the question um, all properly define the relationship between spreads, liquidity, and open interest. Answer B, changes in open interest confirm whatever trend is being observed in the market, is actually not a correct statement, but remember, we're looking for the incorrect statement. So B is the right answer, as we see here. A couple things to remember. Um, as always, look for the key words, in this case, not. Um, remember that higher liquidity means tighter spreads, tighter bid ask or bid offer spreads. And that open interest um, simply means the number of contracts in the market that are not closed out yet or offset. And lastly, remember open interest is about the interest from buyers or sellers, not the direction of the market or the trend in the market. So open interest can either confirm or contradict a trend in the market and simply depends on whether the open interest or an increase in open interest is driven 
by more buyers coming into the market or more sellers coming into the market. So that's it for this question. I hope it's helpful in your uh, test prep and I'll uh, see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Next, we'll look at spreads and straddles. Uh, two very common strategies in the futures markets, futures and option markets, and strategies that you'll come across very often in the uh, test. Hi, here's another test question for your series three test preparation. Um, this is in the section on spreads and straddles. And I wanted to focus on a question specific to spreads, more specifically um, a bull call spread. So the question could be, what is the maximum gain on the following bull call spread? Um, and the question will provide us the, the layout of that spread, and in this case, long a September um, 150 corn call at a certain price and short a 165 call at a different price. Um, we'll get into the specifics of uh, the strategy here in, uh, in just a second. And then we're given a number of answers as to what the maximum gain of this particular spread would be. A couple things are very important. For starters, um, a spread is the buying and selling of the same class, in this case, um, the corn call. So there is buying and selling along and short of the September uh, corn calls at different prices and with different premiums. Now, in this case, um, it is called a bull spread, a bull call spread, because the investor uh, establishing the spread is looking for the market to go up. An easy way to look at that is to say, well, what happens if the price goes way beyond either of the two strike prices? Say it goes to 200 or even higher. In that case, um, both calls are in the money, both get exercised. It means that the holder of the long call can request a purchase price of 150 um, and he will be forced by uh, a buyer of the call to then sell him the, the corn for 165. So at that point, the, um, the, the buyer, the client here will make a gain and no matter how much higher the price goes, um, the gain will be locked in at that 15 point difference. So we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute, but it shows that this is a bull call spread. The investor is looking for the market to go up. Um, a bear spread, the investor is looking for the market to go down. We also know that this is a, uh, a debit spread, a debit versus a credit spread. Meaning here, the long call we pay 350, the short call we receive two. So net, we're we're paying out money, um, and that makes it a debit spread versus a credit spread when we would have received money. With that in mind, we need to determine um, a few things: when does the investor gain, and when does the investor lose? When is the maximum gain and what is the cost of the spread? So let's dig into this a little deeper. We, we addressed some of it already before, but here we can get some more granularity. This investor um, is gaining when the market goes up. And as we saw looking through it just a minute ago, the maximum gain uh, will be achieved when both positions are exercised or assigned. And in our example, that means that the price goes above 165 when both positions are uh, in the money, get exercised and assigned. And the net difference is what is the gain to the investor and is the maximum gain regardless of how much higher the price goes. Now the maximum gain, as we said, um, is then adjusted for the net premium that was paid because not the entire 15 points is what the investor gained. He did 
pay a net premium um, and that net premium the debit spread will be taken uh, away from the maximum gain so the answer in short comes down to these two points we decided the maximum spread the investor can make is the 15 points between 150 and 165 um, he also paid a net premium of 150 the 350 minus the two so the maximum gain here is 1350 it's the 15 in the spread minus the net premium paid and so a is the right answer to this question 1350. a couple of quick things to remember uh, a bull spread is the expectation for the market to go up a bear spread is for the expectation uh, of the market to go down um, a spread is always long and short an option of the same type uh, either puts or calls an underlying commodity uh, in this case the court to profit we saw that at least one of the options need to be in the money and we also determined that the maximum gain happens when both are in the money and once both are in the money it doesn't matter how much farther the price moves that is the maximum amount the investor will make on a bull call spread like this i hope that helped um, good luck with the rest of your test prep and i'll see you here again soon bye bye hi here's another test question for your series three test preparations um, in the area of spreads and straddles um, let's focus on straddles uh, and particularly in this case here a long straddle so the question could be something like this for the following long straddle what is the break-even point for the call and the put and then we would be given a uh, spread in this case a long straddle structure uh, here we have long October um, gold at 1750 long the put and the call at different uh, premiums and the answer to the question about the break-even point will give us values for the call and the put or potentially tell us it's none of the above a couple of things that are important here uh, a straddle is long or short um, a put and a call of the same underlying commodity and the same strike price so in this case we're talking about being long a gold 1750 call and a gold 1750 put the expectation here is that there are going to be significant changes um, in the market price at least when you're establishing the long position if you're on the other side and you are selling the straddle and you have the short side then your expectation is the opposite, uh, namely the absence of uh, significant changes in price. So long versus short straddle is really about buying or selling the options. Here we have a, a long straddle. We bought the call and the put. Um, if we had a short straddle or the other side of this particular transaction, we would have sold the call and the put so with that in mind um, there's basically three things we need to determine when does the investor profit or lose how do we calculate the profit and loss and once we understand that we can determine when the investor breaks even and that is the uh, the key part of the question here so let's dig into this um, a little bit Further. Uh, as we said before, in a long straddle, there is, is profit in case of a significant change, regardless of the direction. If the price goes up, we can profit from the call. If the price goes down, we can profit from the, uh, the put. So the break even point um, is where the profit from the strategy equals. The, the net premium that we paid for this strategy. Um, our profit would get upset 
uh, offset by the premium pay, we break even. Or if we lose and we offset that with the net premium we received, we also break even at zero. Now in this case, let's first see what the, the total premium was that was paid. We had a long straddle, we bought the call, we bought the put, so we paid a premium. Um, in this case, with the, the call at uh, 25 cents, it multiplies by 100 because the call option represents, in the case of gold, um, 100 troy ounce. So on the call side, we paid uh, 100 times 25 cents, on the put side, we paid 100 times 15 cents. So the total, we paid $40 for this long straddle. So the break even then means that the investor needs to earn $40, either on the put or the call, to offset the $40 that he paid in the premiums for this particular um, strategy. Now, on the call side, that means that we would add the $40 to the 1750 strike price on the call. So gold has to go above 1790 for the investor to profit from the call. Um, if it's at 1790, he will break even. Same on the downside of the market. If the market goes down, um, it needs to go down more than 40 for the investor to profit. If it goes down 40 exactly from the strike, in this case to 1710, the investor will um, break even on the put side. So that said, we see that the right answer in terms of the break even for this long straddle is answer A, a call. Um, a call break even point at 1790, a put break even point at 1710. A couple things to remember. Um, break even in general is uh, simply the net premium that is paid or received offsetting any gains or losses. So coming up with a net zero between the gain and the loss and premium. Important to always remember the multiplier. In this case, we had a gold option uh, where the premium gets multiplied by 100, um, representing 100 troy ounce to determine the uh, total premium that was paid or received. And the addition or the subtraction, as we saw uh, on the call side, on the upside, we add the premium that we paid for the long straddle to the call. Um, we subtract it from the downside on the, the strike for the put that we bought. And so the idea is that our transaction, our long straddle is profitable if there is a significant change in the market. Lastly, um, make sure uh, always use the total premium. Um, the, the upside or the downside net gain takes into account uh, offsetting the entire premium. So both the premium for the call and the put need to be um, taken into account when we're trying to figure out a break even point. So here it's the 40 cents per, per contract or the $40 in total that we add to the strike price for the call or subtract from the strike price for the put. So there you have it. I um, hope this is helpful. Uh, the, all the best with the rest of your test prep and I hope to see you again here soon. Bye-bye. Okay, so far so good, right? Next, I would like to focus on two other types of futures contracts, the interest rate and index futures. Hi, right, let's look at another test question for your series three test prep and uh, this time I'd like to focus on the part about interest rate and index futures. The, these are topics that are not um, very, very uh, highly represented in the test, but they certainly are in there. So it's important to know the basics on both of them. And in this one, we'll talk a little bit more about interest rate 
um, futures and options on futures. For instance, the question could be, what is the, the premium on a December Treasury bond future 97 call quoted at 1.32? And we'll get a couple of answers um, that we have to work with in terms of how that quote represents a dollar amount for this particular option contract. Interest rate futures, or for that matter, options on interest rate futures are indicators of interest rate expectations in the future. Besides having uh, different characteristics in, in, in how they are calculated, what they represent, um, there's also a difference between interest rate futures and options on these futures in terms of how they are quoted. Um, interest rate futures are generally quoted in 130 seconds. Um, options on those interest rate futures are quoted in 64. So that obviously makes a significant difference in terms of how you translate a premium that is quoted as part of a, an instrument into a dollar amount as we're trying to do here. Another important um, different, difference between the various interest rate futures is the underlying instrument that a future uh, is related to. So for bonds and notes, this is a, uh, a 100,000 nominal value underlying bond or note, while for a treasury bill, it is a $1 million um, nominal value. Um, we'll get into treasury bills in more detail in another question, but for now, just remember that the underlying instrument for this particular question would be a 100,000 uh, US treasury bond. So a couple of things we need to determine. We first need to uh, determine the multiplier on the contract that will help us convert a quote into a, a dollar amount for premium. We need to determine what the underlying asset is um, and based on that come up with a calculation for the premium in dollars that we're being asked for in this question. So let's look at this a little bit more detail. As I mentioned before, um, options on treasury futures are quoted in 1 64th. So we know that 1 and 32 64th as what we're looking at here um, in terms of quotes on treasury options uh, or options on treasury futures rather equals 1.5%, the, the 32 64th plus the one, one and a half, percent is what the um, the quote represents. We also know that the underlying asset for a uh, treasury bond future is a treasury bond with a nominal value of 100,000. So knowing those two things essentially will give us the dollar value of the premium because it simply is the rate multiplied by the nominal value of the underlying asset. So in this case, the answer would simply be 1.5% times the $100,000 nominal value of the underlying bond, or a premium in dollar terms of $1,500, which is here answer D. So just a couple of quick things. To remember, um, options on treasury futures are quoted differently from the futures themselves. The underlying asset for treasury futures depend on the type of, uh, of a future, whether it's a bond, a note, or a bills futures, and always be very um, cognizant of the fractions and decimals, like in this question where a quote of 1.32 really means 1 and 32 64 for this particular option or 1.5% um, in terms of the calculation to get to a, um, an absolute dollar amount. 
that's it for, for this one. I hope it was helpful. Um, good luck with the rest of your test prep, and I'll see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Okay, another test question in your Series 3 prep um, around interest rate and index futures. And this time I want to focus on the index futures. Now, as I mentioned before, these um, are not uh, widely represented in the test, but they certainly do come up. So it's important to know the relevant uh, facts and, uh, and points around these contracts. Question could be like this, which of the following statements are false regarding the S&P 500 stock index futures? And we'll give them a couple of options. The contract multiplier is 150. The contract has a minimum trading increment of 10 cents. Um, the contracts provide broad exposure with a single order, and it is a very liquid market. A couple important points. The contract multiplier is what converts the premium into a total dollar amount. Um, and for index futures, that is slightly different from what we're seeing in, uh, in other products. The uh, minimum trading increment is also known as the tick size, and we've seen that um, that term come up in other um, contracts as well. And the um, exposure that we're looking to in this question is really something that can be uh, a direct exposure to a broader market, or it can be hedging to protect an existing portfolio. So knowing that, we have to determine essentially three things. We have to look at what the use is of, uh, or the uses of index futures. We have to look at contract specifications, and we have to get an idea about the liquidity of index futures. So let's look at a little bit more detail. Um, the index futures, the S&P 500 index futures, create a very broad exposure because of the underlying asset. The underlying asset is the S&P 500 index, and, and therefore the future on that index um, creates that same broad exposure that the, um, the underlying index um, would, uh, would provide. We also know that the minimum trading increment in this particular contract is 10 cents. So this is the, uh, the tick size that I mentioned earlier. The other thing that's important is that the contract multiplier here uh, for the uh, S&P 500 and index future is 250 times the uh, premium quoted, not the 150 as is mentioned over here. Now, that's relevant not just for this question, but also for potential other questions that you might see about uh, a related S&P 500 futures contract, this time what's called as the, uh, the mini or the e-mini contract, which is essentially a smaller size of the same contract. It's one-fifth of the size of the full S&P 500 future, and because it's one-fifth, the multiplier for the E-mini S&P 500 future is 50, not 250. So keep in mind, um, full contract 250, E-mini 50 as a multiplier. So back to the question, um, A is obviously false. We determined that the contract multiplier is 250, not 150. And uh, since we're looking for the false statement, A is actually the correct answer to this particular question. Uh, again, the contract multiplier is not 150 for the full S&P 500 index future, but 250. A couple things to remember, as always, uh, look for the key word. We were looking for something that was false here. Um, the index futures, especially broader indexes like the uh, S&P 500, are 
either used to that to get direct exposure to the market or can be used for hedging purposes uh, hedging a, a broader based portfolio um, they are highly liquid mar um, instruments they are essentially used as a proxy for the broader market and the two um, uh, contract uh, specs that we talked about specifically for the S&P 500 future is the multiplier being 250 and the tick size being 10 cents. That's it for this one. Uh, I hope it was helpful. Good luck with your uh, test prep and I'll see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Now let's take a closer look at the calculations and conventions we typically find in the futures market. Okay, let's try another test question for your series three uh, prep, this time around calculations and conventions in the futures and options market. This one specifically uh, is about option elasticity. Um, so the question could be based on the following. What is the option elasticity if the stock price increases to $56 a share? And it's given you um, a couple of uh, information items it'll say for instance that the current stock price is is 55 the option with a 50 dollars strike price is currently quoted at three dollars and the delta is 0.7 and we'll come into this uh this a little bit more detail in just a second so based on that uh, we're given a number of potential answers in terms of elasticity, either a percentage or a statement that there might not be enough information to answer the question. A few things to keep in mind. Um, what is option elasticity? It's the relative change in the option price based on a relative change of the underlying stock. It sounds a little complicated once we get into the formula you'll see it really isn't all that complicated the delta on the other hand is not a relative but an absolute indicator of the change in a option price in absolute terms relative to the change in the underlying stock and this we'll also see in a bit more detail once we get into um, the nuts and bolts of this question so two things we need to determine um, what are the relative changes in the prices of the option and the underlying stock and then we have to calculate the option elasticity based on those relative changes so let's look at this in a little bit more detail um, as i mentioned option elasticity is really about how much as a percentage an option changes in value if the related price of the security, in this case, your underlying stock undergoes a price change. So we can, we can say that the option price changes by 70 cents because it has a 0.7 delta in terms of the impact of the change in the underlying security. We saw the underlying security increases by one dollar from 55 to 56 so with a delta of 0.7 that means that the option price will increase by 70 cents or 0.7 of that one dollar um, and that 70 cents is 23 percent of the original option price that we looked at uh, of three dollars similarly the stock price changes by one dollar uh, as is given to us in the question so that percentage wise means an increase from 1.8 percent one dollar divided by 55. so in other words um, if we know that option elasticity is the relative change in the option price divided by the relative change in the stock price the equation then becomes um, what is 23% divided by 1.8%, the percentages that we just calculated in terms of relative changes. Once we do that, we come up with 12.77%, and we'll see that answer B is here the correct answer 
the 12.77% that we came up with as the calculation for the option elasticity. Two things to remember, um, option elasticity, uh, as we treated it here, is a relative change, a percentage change in the option price divided by the percentage change in the underlying security price, um, in this case, the price of the underlying share. And the delta um, is a measure of absolute change um, and shows the absolute change in the option price relative to the change in the underlying security price. So with these elements, um, we came to the right answer and calculated the uh, option elasticity correctly. I hope this helps in your, uh, your test prep. Uh, good luck and I'll uh, see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Hi, let's do another uh, series three uh, test question in your test prep. And this one is around calculations and conventions in the futures market. Question could be um, about long hedgers. Long hedgers are all of the following, except that they, and then there's going to be a number of different statements, uh, except that they can be a user of a commodity, that they are short the basis if they are in a position to be obligated to deliver a physical commodity, that they purchase futures to protect against a decreasing commodity price, or that they can be someone who does not own the commodity but is contractually obligated to deliver it. So the question is around which of these statements is um, not correctly identifying a long hedger. So as we saw already, uh, as I always hammer on the keywords here, we're talking about accept. So which does not properly state what a long hedger represents. So for starters, long hedge, meaning you are long the futures, you are short the cash or either the commodity or, or the near commodity. So that is important to keep in mind, long hedge, meaning long the futures. The other term we come across here, short the basis, um, is essentially the same as being short the commodities or being short the, uh, the near month compared to the farther out futures. So based on this, we need to determine two things. We need to determine really when a long hedge is applicable uh, based on what a long hedge represents. And then we need to have an opinion on which risk or risks a long hedge is actually mitigating. So let's look into this in a little bit more detail. A long hedge um, or a long hedger is long the futures, meaning he implements a protective measure against being short the commodity. Um, because being short the commodity exposes that individual to a uh, the risk of future price increases. Um, someone long the commodity, on the other hand, will enter into a short hedge or selling the futures to protect against future price decreases. So whether you're long or short, the commodity obviously will determine what risk you are trying to hedge. If you're short, commodity, you will hedge a price increase. If you're long the commodity, you will um, hedge a price decrease. So in other words, answers A, B, and D all describe long hedgers as we've defined them here. Answer C actually describes a short hedger um, because the short hedger is the one who is protecting against future price decreases. So answer C is therefore incorrect as an answer to what a long hedger represents. But remember, we're looking for the incorrect answer. So C is the right answer 
to this question. A couple things to remember, as always, uh, keywords, we're talking about accept here, so we're looking for the wrong answer. A long hedge is being long the futures, but short the commodities. And a long hedge, as we saw, protects against future price increases as opposed to a short hedge where you short the futures, which protect against future price decreases. Long hedges are typically for producers and other parties with the need for a commodity in the future and therefore um, want to hedge against a future price increase. Um, short hedges, on the other hand, are for those looking to sell a commodity in the future. For instance, the common example of cattle ranchers looking to sell beef into the future and they're hedging against future price decreases. So there you have it. I hope that is helpful for your Series 3 test prep and I look forward to seeing you here again soon. Bye-bye. Another important topic is the margin and assignments area around futures and options. Let's take a closer look. Hi, let's look at another sample test question for your series three test, uh, this time around margins and assignments related to futures and futures on options. The initial, the question could be as follows. Uh, if the initial margin required to buy or sell a futures contract is $6,000, the maintenance margin is $4,500, what is the amount of the margin call if losses on open positions reduce the cash in the account to $4,000, then we get a couple of dollar amounts that we can choose from. A um, couple of important points. Uh, we talk about initial margin, which is the margin that needs to be satisfied um, at the time of the trade. We talk about maintenance margin that is to be satisfied as long as an open position uh, is maintained. Minimum levels for these margin um, amounts are established by the exchange where the contract trades. Um, a broker, however, can apply more conservative levels, um, not more relaxed levels if they desire to do so. And a margin call is um, the request for additional cash or equity in the account if the cash has fallen below the maintenance level um, that is required for that particular contract. So knowing that, uh, we need to determine basically three things. We need to determine initial and maintenance margin levels. We need to determine the equity or the cash in the account. And then eventually the um, margin call, if any, that might be resulting from the reduction in equity in the account. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. The initial margin does not need to be maintained after a position has been established. However, the maintenance margin does need to be maintained for the life of the position. And the maintenance margin here, um, the minimum requirement there was 4,500 um, with cash or equity in the account at 4,000 is no longer maintained. So a margin call will um, be issued to require to restore the cash or the equity. Um, and the important part here is that that uh, will be restored to the level of the initial margin level, not the maintenance level. So it is not bringing it back up in this case to $4,500, but it's bringing it back up to $6,000. Or in other words, we see the equity level in the account or the cash level in the account is, is 4,000, as we said, it's below the, the maintenance level uh, required. The initial margin was 6,000. So a $2,000 margin call will be issued to restore the initial margin requirement level. Uh, again, important to realize we go back to the initial margin, not the maintenance margin, a 
dollar margin call will be issued, which is answer B as we see it here. A couple quick things to remember. Um, initial and maintenance margin requirements um, apply at different times. The initial margin level at the establishing the trade the position, the maintenance level for the duration of that position um, in the client account. The minimum margin levels are established by the listing exchanges. Brokers can be more conservative if they want to. They cannot be less conservative. Um, the cash in the account or the equity in the account will be adjusted as the value of the futures position goes up or down. And if that cash level goes below the maintenance level, a margin call will be issued. And again, the important part is the margin call will bring the cash back to the initial margin levels, not just the maintenance margin level. So there you have it. I hope that's helpful. Um, good luck with your test prep and I'll hope to see you again here very soon. Bye bye. Hi, let's have another test question uh, in your series three test prep, uh, this time around assignments, assignments on option as part of the margin and assignment uh, section. So the question could be when are option assignments normally made? we might be presented with a couple of different options. Um, within 48 hours following receipt by the exchange of the exercise instruction, on the expiration date of the option, um, on the day the option clearing corporation receives the exercise instruction, or the business day following the receipt by the option clearing corporation of the exercise notice. A couple things are important um, when we start looking at this in more detail. First off, the exercise process. Exercising is essentially the holder of an option, invoking the right associated with that option. Uh, so in uh, the case of a call to initiate a buy, in the case of a put, um, initiate a sell transaction. The assignment is the mirror image of that, is basically the seller of the option who will be allocated the obligation associated with the option he or she sold. So this is the other side of the exercise piece of the option. Exchanges manage the trade execution and the contract specifications around futures and options. Um, the option clearing corporation is the entity that manages the clearing of executed trades for its members and as we'll see um, are a significant entity in this whole exercise and assignment process. So we need to determine two things. We need to see which entity oversees the option exercise and assignment uh, process and then we need to uh, decide within which timeline exercises and assignments are completed. So let's look at this a little bit more detail. As we said before, exchanges are the entities responsible for the execution and for the specifications of the contracts that are traded on their trading floors and their trading systems. Um, the Option Clearing Corporation or the OCC is the entity that clears executed trades and not only that, it is also the entity that manages the option, the option exercise and assignment process. So in other words, option assignments are normally made by the option clearing corporation. And they are normally done the business day following the receipt of the instruction from the holder of that option to, to exercise the rights that are embedded in that option. And so here, that means that the correct answer is um, option, is answer D, um, that the assignments are normally made on the business day following the receipt by the option clearing corporation of the exercise notice. The uh, answers A, B, and C do not correctly reflect what an option assignment process 
um, really needs. So a couple things to remember. Um, option trade executions take place at an exchange. Uh, the trade clearing, the exercising and assignment is done by the option clearing corporations. Um, those notices for exercising assignments um, are generally made at the day following the receipt of the initial notion of an exercise and the holders or the buyers of option of an option exercise the rights embedded in those options. Sellers, on the other hand, of options fulfill the obligation resulting from those buyers exercising their options. So that's it for this question. I hope it's, uh, it's helpful. Uh, good luck with the rest of your test prep and I'll uh, see you here again soon. Bye-bye. And last, but certainly not least, the area of rules and regulations. Let's look at a couple of sample questions on this topic you might see in the test. Okay, let's look at another test question for your series three uh, test prep. Um, at this time, uh, let's focus on rules and regulations. A question that could come up is, for instance, which of the following is not true regarding the National Futures Association or NFA investigation of alleged violations and complaints. And then we're giving a couple of different options that members may be subject to an unannounced on-site review performed by the NFA, that full NFA member audits are conducted every 24 months, that not all complaints originate from the NFA, and or that all NFA complaints are treated equally in terms of merit and worthiness of investigation. So a couple of important things. Uh, first, as always, we're looking here for the not true. So we're looking for the false answer. Um, very, uh, seems very obvious, but um, very easy to forget. Um, we know that NFA members are subject to formal audits and also uh, to ad hoc on-site visits, and we also know that the NFA does reviews, um, investigates and sanctions violations and complaints that are brought to it. So with that in mind, we need to determine three things. We need to determine the timing of formal NFA audits. We need to determine uh, the NFA's ability to initiate additional reviews, and we need to make a decision on how violations and complaints are going to be treated. So let's dig in a little further. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that the, the rules state that full NFA audits are conducted every two years. The rules also allow for the fact that the NFA can initiate unannounced on-site reviews. And uh, it's also important to remember complaints that are submitted to the NFA are not only from, from the NFA itself. It can also be from customers, from other member firms, in addition to those that are initiated by the NFA itself. Um, and lastly, it's important to know that the NFA reviews complaints before deciding whether or not to warrant um, further investigations. So all that said, we can say that answers A, B, and C describe the NFA function as it relates to the investigation of, a, of alleged violations and complaints. Um, answer D does not describe that properly. But as we remember, we're looking for the incorrect answer so D is the right answer to this question in that uh, it is not true that all NFA complaints are treated equally in terms of merit and worthiness of investigations. The NFA determines whether or not that is the case and then goes into a further investigation mode if it is so warranted. Couple of things to remember at the end. Uh, again, look out for the keywords. Here, 
focus on the fact that we're talking about not true, which is the false answer. We learned that LFA audits are conducted every two years. Um, we also learned that unannounced on-site visits to members can be initiated by the NFA and that complaints can be brought by different industry participants and are reviewed by the NFA before initiating further investigation. So these are all important aspects of the, uh, the process of investigation by the NFA of violations and complaints. Hope that was helpful. Um, good luck with the rest of your test prep and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Okay, another test question for your series three test preparation, um, this time in the area of rules and regulation. And let's focus on the uh, commodity delivery process. So the, the question could be which of the following is true regarding the commodity delivery process. And we could have seen a couple of different answers, like for instance, um, delivery can be made directly to the buyer if all parties agree. In case of multiple approved delivery locations, it's the buyer who decides where to accept delivery. The delivery process is determined by the exchange within which the commodity contract trades. And once delivery is made, the buyer can request to have it inspected for quality, grade, and quantity. So a couple of things to keep in mind um, here. First of all, depending on the commodity, uh, it is possible that multiple approved delivery locations can be designated. It depends on the commodity, um, depends on the exchange where it trades, but multiple approved locations are possible for certain contracts. Um, deliveries are made for predetermined quality grades uh, of those underlying committed uh, commodities. And so in the end, we need to determine a couple of things. We need to determine who decides on the location of a commodity delivery, um, who determines the overall delivery process, and when and initiated by whom, if at all, an inspection of a delivery can be requested. So let's dig into this a little deeper. Um, standardization is a key aspect of futures trading. Um, and many aspects, therefore, uh, that are standardized cannot be changed even if both parties agree. One area where there is some flexibility for participants to agree is when there is a choice of multiple delivery locations for a commodity. In that case, it is the seller in the transaction who decides which location the uh, commodity will be delivered to. The standardization also extends to um, inspection of quality, grade, and quantity. Because of the standardization, um, that is done as a matter of fact from uh, the perspective of the organizing exchange. And so no special request for an inspection can be made. It is part of the standardized process around delivery. So in other words, answers A, B, and D all incorrectly describe elements of the commodity delivery process. Answer C states it correctly. Um, and that is that the delivery process is determined by the exchange within which the commodity contract trades. So C is the right answer to our question here. A few things to remember. Um, as always, look out for the key words. Here we're looking at what was true in terms of the statements that we were offered. Um, it's important to remember that standardization is a very key element in the futures markets in general and extends to uh, most aspects of the process, including the delivery process. So it therefore also eliminates the need or the possibility to request a specific um, inspection for quality grade um, and quantity because that is part of the standardized process around it. 
The one decision that is left up to the seller in a delivery is to which location to deliver in case of multiple approved locations, as we found out. So there you have it. Um, I hope that helps in your uh, test prep. Um, good luck with the rest of it, and I'll hope to see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Okay, that's already the end of this training video. I hope it was uh, helpful. If you're interested in any further trading opportunities or want to practice for other tests, by all means, reach out to me directly. Um, good luck with the rest of your prep and all the best of luck with your tests. Bye-bye.